Welcome back, everybody, to the third edition of the Shot 3 from the T podcast. I am your host of the podcast, Jason Roslin. Today I'm just going to be by myself for this first little bit, and then in segment two, I'm going to be joined by Matt Jones, TFR on Twitter, at Matt Jones TFR. Sorry, forgot the at there a little bit. But uh, So we're going to talk just briefly before we bring on Matt about some of the things uh, we talked about last night on the opening T podcast going to start here with the top five breakdown, of course, of the salaries, going to the field changes, which there were a bunch this week. Got some open qualifiers to talk about as well. Sponsor exemptions, there's six this week and definitely a couple in play. Uh, And then opening ads and salary discussion before we bring on Matt. So let's break right onto it here as the top five breakdown. Pretty obvious, Henrik Stenson, I got right. Missed the salary by 100 bucks. He comes in at 11.4 versus the 11.3, I guessed. The second one, I'm not going to give myself credit for, but I did mention that if Cameron Champ was actually printed in the field, he likely would come in second priced. And he did, um, and he is in the field, but I still can't get it right. I had Scotty Scheffler there. Next guy I had was uh, Brian Harmon because Jason Kokrak dropped out of the field. So Brian Harmon I had at 10.4. He actually comes in at 10.6. I next had Keegan Bradley at 10.2. But they actually went with Daniel Berger here at 10.4. Um, they priced Keegan Bradley down at 9,000 uh, this week. Probably now going to create a little bit of an ownership bubble there because of that. And then I got the last one right. Since Jason Kograk bumped down, the next guy I mentioned was Russell Henley. Uh, that I really didn't think they were going to put above 10K. But with Jason Kograk uh, jumping out of the tournament, withdrawing, that moves Russell Henley up to 10.1K. So I'll give myself, well, I got Stenson's price right, but that's a given. Brian Harmon I got right, and Henley I got right. So two out of five in their positioning. Uh, didn't get any of the pricing right this week, though. Off by 100 bucks, but that's what you got to expect. I'm only dealing with a you know, a $2,000 differential between 10K and, 11, uh, 10K and up. So anyways, uh, that uh, not bad, not great either. Um, didn't see Daniel Berger, probably should have. He was pretty highly owned and coming in with good form and good course form too. So uh, no surprise to see Berger there. So okay, let's go into the field changes and uh, pretty disappointing um, to be completely honest. We've got Jimmy Walker dropping out. He was one of the better players in the field. Uh, Derek Ernst takes his spot. But Ryan Blom is out, uh, and that got in. Uh, somebody else I'll get in a second. John Rollins was the last sponsor exemption that wasn't already uh, noted. Uh, John Rollins comes in. He's a just a tour pro that has uh, been around for quite a little time. Jason Kokrak, who I mentioned, Andres Romero, and Tim Wilkinson all bowing out, uh, and that moved in. Rookie Barnes, Daniel Chopra, and John Merrick. And then the last one we had is Nick Taylor, after a good couple of weeks here in the fall, is going to take a week off, it seems. And in comes Tommy Ganey, um, known for wearing his two gloves on his driver. And, uh, yep, Tommy Ganey in the field uh, this week. So the last one we're looking for was uh, Ryan Blom is out. And, again, I apologize. I, for some reason, forgot to write that down. But, um... Blom is in, and Tim Heron. Tim Heron is in replacing Ryan Blom. So it's going down the past champions list, no doubt about it. So now we can move on to our uh, second topic of discussion, the open qualifiers. We'll quickly review last week's just to kind of show you that, hey, you know, sometimes these guys, money qualifiers, they can definitely be rosterable. I actually rostered one of them last week in my biggest uh, lineup, John Oda. He made the cut, provided some pretty nice value there as well, scoring over 70 DraftKings points at a $6,300 value. Pretty good. Um, Isaiah Salinda made the cut as well by making a 30-footer on 18. Didn't quite get back to value, um, or or above 10x, I should say, but still made the cut. If you rostered him and, and opened the door up to get in Cantlay, definitely would have helped you in there. So uh, Andrew Novak had a hot round two, but it fell short. And Dylan Wu, the fourth guy, had a hot round one, was actually in the top 10, and then fell short in round two, ended up missing the cut. So move on to this week's open qualifiers. First one is Logan McCracken. Uh, he's been grinding on the mini tours for, for quite some time now. Um, second guy, Andy Zhang, a 20-year-old year old from China who certainly had some promise coming into the year last year on the Corn Ferry Tour. 
but didn't really materialize. Uh, he will play here this week. George Cunningham, who's currently on the Corn Ferry Tour, a 24-year-old from University of Arizona. Some accolades. He came 36 that last year. Shriners Open, so certainly can perform against this field um, or a field like this. We've seen him play in a couple of events on the PGA Tour. Last one is Jeremy Gandon. Uh, he just graduated from Kansas State. He's from France. He's played a couple of starts since turning pro on the McKenzie Tour. Uh, he, uh, like I said, he's a Monday qualifier, so interesting little stuff there. Maybe take a little bit deeper dive on Jeremy Gandon, as I haven't heard that name before. Uh, a couple of sponsors exemptions now. Uh, Brandon Bailey and David Vanderwalt from the Web.com Tour Finals, or excuse me, Corn Ferry Tour Finals. Uh, the next one, or I'll say the next two that we're going to talk about now are definitely on my radar this week. And that's Cole Hammer, currently ranked number two amateur in the world. Goes to Texas from Texas. Just a Texas guy all the way around. Kind of has a Texas name in there too, Cole Hammer. Um, definitely an interesting play this week. Gets a sponsor exemption in. Uh, the next one, Brandon Wu just turned pro. He's a heralded star out of Stanford. Uh, waited to turn pro uh so he could play in the Walker Cup, which is, you know, the Ryder Cup of amateurs. And played very well at the U.S. Open. So definitely can come out here and compete. Very interested in Brandon Wu this week. The next one is Chandler Phillips, who uh, I admit I, I've only heard maybe once or twice. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more digging. He went to Texas A&M. He was ranked sixth in the amateur in the world before turning pro. Uh, according to my notes here, this will be his first start uh, on the PGA Tour. So... Uh, maybe a couple more sponsors exceptions uh, in uh, available for him, especially a, an amateur ranked top 10 in the uh, world. Definitely somebody to keep a look at. So three guys that are in play. And then Michael Piraeus, I think that's how you say it. He went to University of Houston. Um, so local guy, probably played the course a bunch. Um, but I don't think he's quite nearly as good as the other three guys I just mentioned. So I'll be focusing the shares that I give on those three. Um, so hopefully that gives you... A little bit of a against the grain uh, look into some of the players playing this week, and now we can head into our opening odds and salary discussion, where I pick everywhere from uh, one from under twenty-five to one, one from over forty to one, and one from over one hundred to one. Last week, not bad, pretty average. I had Matt Wolf there at fifty to one, Colin Morikawa at twenty-six to one. Uh, and my long shot, Christopher Ventura, was actually not bad, but just missed that top 10, um, which would have certainly helped out. So this week, Scotty Scheffler is a really interesting case. He opened very quickly at 33 to 1, and I mean really quickly. Uh, and it was mentioned a couple of times on Twitter, and all of a sudden he went down to 22 to 1. So really quick there. Um, next guy I'm going to focus on is Doc Redman. He was absolutely on fire with his approaches last week. We're getting into Bermuda grass, which hopefully uh, he'll be able to manage a little bit better than he did putting last week. So he's at 80 to 1. And then a guy that we're going to talk about, uh, Matt and I are going to talk about here coming up on our next segment, is Tom Hoagie, 100 to 1 this week, fits the course, uh, playing in pretty good form. So we'll chat about him, like I said, in the uh, next segment. So uh, until then, uh, I will sign off right now. Um, just for a couple of seconds here as we switch over to the uh, the other segment here. Um, hope you've enjoyed this part of it where it's, again, a quick 10-minute introduction into the field a little bit, into who's playing, how I did with my pricing, some of the field changes of guys that have withdrawn, so make sure they're not in your lineups if DraftKings or FanDuel missed taking them out of their player pool. Always something to keep note of. So. Want to see something else on this uh, podcast or want to see a uh, another segment? I've heard a couple of people talk about a bank roll segment. Um, certainly touched on that last night uh, on my opening teapod. I will uh, open it up a little bit as we move into the uh, fall swing here. We've only got three or four more weeks left, uh, and then we'll have a couple of open weeks where I'm still going to do a podcast. Uh, I'll only do one podcast, and it'll probably be about a half hour. That's where I'm going to try and get some of these uh, what I'll call evergreen materials, or not what I'll call what the uh, what it's known as. Um, so just can just stay around, and hopefully you can gain something from it. I'll, I'll probably do two or three in the three weeks that we're off, um, and cover different topics like that. So want to hear something else? Bankroll management, contest selection, etc. 
I will touch on all of those during our little bit of an off season in this format. So if I'm not covering it now, I'm not ignoring you, I promise. I'm just uh, saving it for uh, when we uh, may need a little bit more content. So until the next segment, uh, we'll sign off. Uh, see you on the other side, everybody. Cheers. All right, everybody. Welcome back for segment two here where I'm going to go over some of the statistical focus that I mentioned last night on the opening tea pod. And I am joined uh, by the statistical nut himself, Matt Jones. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Matt Jones TFR. And I'm Matt, back for the second week. So we must have done something right, right? Because we're here for our second episode together and at least a few people listen to us, right? I know. It was, like a, it was like a first date. I didn't know how long I had to wait to DM you to see if I was coming on again. It was, it was a very stressful thing for me. So I'm, I'm, glad I, uh, I, I'm glad I made the cut. Yeah, yeah. Podcasting, dating is, is always a, a, a fun and exciting thing. So now, maybe not so fun and exciting as I, I just covered a little bit in the last segment. Um, this field is, is rather weak this week, but for the fall swing prizes, it's not really weak. We got normal DraftKings contests, so the research is just as important, if not more important, this week, wouldn't you think? Oh, yeah, for sure. When I uh, when I was scrolling through the field, I was... I was uh, very disappointed, but at least at least the lobbies look pretty good still. So. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, we don't even get Jordan Spieth here in this field, let alone anybody else that's uh, of any stature. So um, Henrik Stenson is here, of course, uh, as we just mentioned. So a couple of the stats that I found, um, and, it, and it looks like before we came on, we chatted a little bit, and it looks like maybe we had similar types of uh, similar types of uh, thoughts at least, and that's the proximity. Between uh, over 200 yards, which I mentioned last night, and then a heavy emphasis on approaches this week. You know, as Russell Henley was the only winner in the last four or five years to gain over four strokes for the week off the tee. Um, so those are the two that I focused on. Uh, before we go into the players, do you have any other ones that you want to take a look at? Um, yeah, I figure we could uh, we could chat a little bit um, if you're uh, if you follow along over on. Uh, at Rotoviz, one of our tools, we use a, a splits app, and we kind of, you know, separate it by uh, a golfer's performance by course length or par or whatever. And, and this uh, this week, there's definitely something to uh, strokes gained tee to green on courses longer than 7,400 yards. So definitely something interesting to uh, take a peek at this week. Yeah, and it's obviously we've been playing the last at least three weeks. It seems like it's been, you know, 71 or 72 at... 7,100 or 7,200 yards. And people say, well, what's 200 yards? Well, it matters. It, it matters almost in, you know, if, if you look at the hole, if it's dispersed evenly between the hole, it would add, what, you know, 20 yards per hole roughly. Um, so, and obviously it's not dispersed in the holes. There's more beef to these part fours. There's a, a little more beef to the part threes as well. Um, so we'll get into those. So on the first one that I found, and now granted, we only have three weeks, four weeks of data here, so not a ton, but Guys that are hitting it well from over 200 yards, one of the names that I want to talk about for just a second here is James Hahn. Um, James Hahn was gone for the tour for like six months, and now he was only one start. So this is just against last week's field. He was 19th in proximity from 200 plus yards, and then came in 16th in strokes gained approach. So not a lot of lag time for him. I mean, he just seemed to get right back into it. Is it too early to, to look at James Hahn in a field like this, um, or did he come across uh, your wavelength at all other than that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I could definitely definitely see the case for that. Um, you know, 6,600 uh, in this field, I feel like, is is very reasonable, um, especially with those numbers uh, off, a, off of a bit of a layoff here. So, yeah, I would... Uh, I would definitely consider him in, uh, in some GPPs. All right, one one more name uh, that I'll throw out uh, from the proximity uh, over 200 yards uh, and then see if you have any. One that kind of piqued my interest was Tom Hoagie. He's top 25 this year in his couple starts, 35th in strokes gained approach, so pretty good. And then when we go to last year, he was 20th from 200 plus yards and also 39th in strokes gained approach. So maybe this is kind of the strength of his game that I'm seeing. In, in the, the screener that I looked at, he was the only one to hit all three of the screeners. So um, 7,400, been playing kind of well. What say you about Tom Hoagie? Uh, yeah, you can you can always talk me into uh, into some Tom Hoagie. <laughs> uh, whether that's always worked out for me or not is another conversation. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it makes sense, right? Like, we're used to seeing him perform kind of well on uh, on some of these longer part threes. Like, that was kind of his MO, um, you know, when he first started, or more recently started finding some success. So, yeah, I can, uh, I can get on board with that, too. And, again, a, a very palatable price at uh, 7400 Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, how about you? Any, any screeners that found you in the over 200 proximity uh, matched up with strokes gained approach? Um, yeah, so I when I took a look at this, uh, like I mentioned last week, I kind of took uh, you know a longer term approach and just was sort of trying to see if there's any uh, any sort of signal with um, you know just general talent uh, with with proximity, you know, longer irons. And uh, Henrik Stenson obviously is always going to pop up in something like that. I I don't know what the hell to make of Henrik Stenson in general most weeks, mm -hmm. but the fact that he came over here uh, in the fall for this, I, I feel like has to count for something, right? Like, yeah, I mean, and there's the Italian Open going on, on on the European Tour, which is one of their Rolex Series events, so the purse, I, I believe, is relatively similar. But yeah, interesting. It, and now probably he liked, maybe it has something to do with him liking the course. We see two top tens um, in, in two of his last starts mixed in with a missed cut there in between, which is very Henrik Stenson-like, um, yeah. right? It's, it's, you know, boom or bust kind of thing. Now, we're not used to seeing him top price to the field. The last time we saw him very close to the top of the field, at least price-wise, though, um, for me, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, was the Wyndham Championship last year where it was him and Ollie that came down in the end, and he ended up paying off his salary then. So just a, a kind of maybe a, a deeper discussion on Henrik Stenson, um, but certainly in play this week, his long irons, they've been the best, or one of the best for, for quite some time. Um, all right, anybody else uh, over 200 that you want to bring up? Um, longer term, Graham Dillette popped up. Yep. Uh, <laughs> just from like a, you know, a, a career perspective, I guess you would say. He, we, haven't, we haven't seen him a ton. Uh, I guess he missed the cut last week, but um, I don't know. That's, that's probably more of like a, if you're making 150, you can throw him in one and, and hope for the best. <laughs> for yeah. 63. Yeah, exactly. And, and Graham Dillette, he's a guy that, you know, we saw top five of the PGA Championship, was in the winning millionaire maker lineup that, that year a couple of years ago, and then had real the same surgery, if I'm not mistaken, as Tiger uh, had. And uh, interesting to see, though, with him, uh, take a look at his strokes game from last week. Obviously, it's a good barometer of where we think he is. He lost two strokes around the green, which is no surprise for Graham Dillette. Um, has been vocal about his struggles around the green and chipping. Considered he had the chipping yips, um, which is just very terrible. I hope he doesn't have that anymore. Putting was bad, and off the tee was the worst. Um, so maybe if the off the tee comes around, the approaches, he actually gained 1.2 strokes in his two rounds. Uh, so maybe not too far off with his irons, but obviously the short game, you know, losing almost three strokes, so six strokes in two rounds, that's going to need to share up. However, um, he's probably not too far off, though. Especially seeing those irons gaining 1.2, that that's got to be somewhat encouraging, right? Oh, for sure. And I, like you said, you know, if he can, if he can just be sort of neutral up the tee, um, we know his irons can click when he gets rolling. So um, it, we might not be able to see him at uh, 6,300 uh, for a very long time. No, especially you know that first top 25. You know, the next week he plays, he'll be well above the 6,300 number. So, all right, one more name that has come out um, and has been. Up and down, I'll say more up with his irons uh, than down. Of the four events over the fall, he's gained uh, at least on average 0.75 per round, three of the four starts. And I'm talking about Doc Redman. Um, not a ton of stats on him. When we did see him go for his nice run, he it was really his putting that he was leaning on, but now we're starting to see a little bit more of his game. Did he pique your interest at all? Seems reasonably placed in this field at 7,200. Um, yeah, I think that I think that makes some sense. Um, I, like you said, we don't have a ton of uh, a ton of information on him. You know, I guess he what does he have? Maybe fifteen or sixteen starts uh, since the beginning of twenty eighteen. So yeah, I mean, I, I think we have a pretty good uh, uh, somewhat of a feel for who he is. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he put together a couple of good events in the uh, in this kind of weak field yeah and obviously a uh, former uh, i believe that us uh, am winner so a ton of talent right. there so um 
Okay, so we'll go move on now to the uh, stat that you brought up. But this is the strokes gained on courses over 7,400 yards. Again, 200 yards certainly matters. These guys will tell you that as well. It's less wedges in your hand. Um, we talked about one guy before we came on, and Russell Henley is just ridiculously good here. You know, we, we, we've talked at length, you know, in outside of this about whether course history exists or not. It's really more about course fit. And Russ Henley just seems to fit this course. Now, the one thing I'll say is he's been vocal about being really good on fast greens. He's actually even had some success at Augusta. This tournament was played at Augusta, before Augusta every single year that it was played. So the greens were always tricked up. The stint meter was 13. Do you expect first to see the greens that fast again? And second, do you expect the change of date to affect Russell Henley? Or is this more about him over 7,400 yards and being better with his long irons? Yeah, that's that's sort of something I've been struggling with, whether or not they're going to have a similar setup. I, I don't... I don't think it's going to be quite as uh, Augusta-ish, yep. um, but I do think that there are definitely some similarities um, just from the way that it's the way that the course plays in general. So even if it's even if they slowed down the greens a little bit or let the rough grow out a little bit more around those greens, I, I don't think it's going to play terribly different. Um, but yeah, since since the start of 2014, uh, Henley has averaged twice as many, over twice as many strokes gained tee to green on longer courses. So definitely, definitely a course fit thing going on here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and before I, I have you give some of your other guys that you found in this stats, one thing I want to bring up, and I don't know if you look at this, and we talked a little bit about it um, last night, and uh, I'm sorry, not last night, last week, and that's about the different types of grass. Now, prior to this, because it was done, again, this tournament was done in the spring, right before Augusta. They had a, a rye mix for their fairways and rough, and they used a bent poa mix for the greens. It's now gone to Bermuda grass everywhere. Tiff Sport Bermuda grass and the Mini Verde on greens. Do you think that makes a difference? Um, yeah, I definitely pay attention to that for putting splits. Um, obviously not as, not as important for any, uh, to me at least, for any other stats. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely pay attention to that for um, guys that we should be targeting that, you know, every once in a while you run into a guy who just can't putt on a particular surface. So definitely uh, definitely worth mentioning. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, that may be a little bit of a discussion going forward because it goes from one surface, the Benton Poe, to Bermuda, which is obviously very different. Um, so found that interesting, obviously, that – you know, brings up things in, in my eyes like, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if Keith Mitchell's in the field, but I know that he, along with Daniel Berger, who actually has some pretty good success here, um, is statistically better putter on Bermuda than he is on Bent Poe. So just thought I'd bring that up. Okay, back to the stat. Strokes gained um, over uh, courses over 7,400 yards. We mentioned Russ Henley. Um, how about a couple others? Yeah, funny enough, Berger uh, I had highlighted. So he, all right, <laughs> he fits this. Uh, he fits the bill here too. Um, positive splits on these longer courses. Uh, he improved on approach last week uh, and finished 18th. Um, so yeah, for sure. When he when he's on Bermuda, and it seems like he uh, seems like he kind of clicked a little bit. Um, Berger's definitely a guy who is piquing my interest, and I hardly ever roster Berger. So <laughs> take that for. Take that if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely in on Berger this week. Yeah, um, it's it's really funny you say that. I, if if uh, people listening watch my show on Wednesday was Ben um, Jazz Rats, they, they know that I am just not a huge fan of Berger, but I've learned to play Berger on Berger courses like you know St. Jude, even though we missed the cut last year. Um, it seems to be like a Berger course. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think there's definitely a trend there. Um, and then the other guy, real quick, who is who's been sort of playing uh, playing well recently is Scotty Scheffler. Uh, he's 9900, uh, and he gains about two more strokes uh, tee to green on these longer courses. Um, and Bermuda's kind of like his. He's awful on Poa, so I'm not scared off uh, from uh, his Bermuda splits. Yeah, and putting wasn't good last week. Actually, nothing was really good, but you saw the the, the climax. He, he was 700 heading into the weekend last week and played okay on Friday. And you saw when he made those first two early bogeys on Saturday, he, he kind of just checked it in. He knew he wasn't yeah. getting 
anywhere close to the top with, with non Cantley and others up there. So um, it doesn't really concern me. Well, perfect. We're right on just about 14 minutes, just over 14 minutes for the segment. So right at where we like to keep it. Um, Matt, anything else uh, for this uh, week? Well, actually, I'll have one more question for you. What contest? They, they just put out a bunch of them. Any contest that you'll be focusing on this week? Uh, some people asked me last week about bankroll and stuff like that. What is one contest that you'll be looking at this week to play in? Uh, I'm I'm very much in the uh, in the single entry, three entry. I kind of live in that area in most sports. Okay. Um, yep. And golf is definitely no exception. I I believe it's the scramble. Yeah, the scramble this week. It's a little smaller. I I, I prefer like. The dog leg single entry. That there's one yeah. there that I see. Yep. And if you haven't uh, scoured the the lobby, we're talking about the dog leg thirty three dollar twenty k guaranteed. And then Matt also mentioned the scramble, which is a twenty dollar three uh, person. And it looks like that's probably what like seven or ten k guaranteed this week. Yeah, seven k. Yep. Yeah. So th- that's kind of where I live usually. I, I obviously you'd love to. Uh, I'd love to, to chase the the payouts that you uh, that you take down, Jason. But I'm uh, I'm a little bit lower on the bankroll scale here, so I kind of live in those smaller single and triple entries. Yep. Hey, totally understand. I had a bunch of runner ups last week, so a bunch of uh, a bunch of second places is no good um, in, in my book, I guess. Especially <laughs> especially when it's so top heavy. You know, you got something like you know 250k guaranteed, and 25 percent of it's going to first. So. Tough to uh, tough to do that. Anyways, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the segment. Matt uh, will hopefully join me uh, again next week. So, Matt, thanks for coming on. For sure, man. Thanks for having me.